Good morning, Acts chapter number 8, part 7, in our fine-tooth comb study of the uh, scriptures here. We're going to pick back up in Acts chapter number 8 and look today a little more in-depth at Simon the Sorcerer. I want to kind of get through some of these the issues of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost and things like that before who the Samaritan people were. And then I want to look at a little bit Simon's life today. I want to look and show you who he is and... As I studied this out for a little while, I, I came to conclude a couple of things. I, I read it over and over and over again, and, and you know, the more you read something, the more you kind of study it out, the more, the more you start to see connections, the more you start to see pieces of the puzzle start to you know, fit together a little better, and you correlate other scriptures, and that's probably the, the best gift you can get out of the scripture, is when you make correlations between two passages of scripture. I mean, that's when you start to get excited. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm seeing where he's going on that one, and I'm seeing where he's going on that one. And I'm getting that part too. And it's not that you're necessarily reading it between the lines. It's just that you're having the same spiritual maturity that the Apostle Paul had. You're getting the same spiritual maturity that Peter had. The same spiritual maturity that other scripture writers had. And then you're starting to come together and realize, wow, this is not written by man. I mean, there's just no way we can have all these correlations. It just doesn't work like that, you know. It's just the, 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 the continuity of the scriptures. I talk about that all the time because to me, that's what gets me so excited about it. I read it and I go, man, that's so cool to see that. Just work with that and that there. And that's where he's going on that. And sure, there's stuff that you don't always understand the first time you read it. It's how it always is going to go. But that's the beauty and the joy of it is that over time, the more you study and the more you uh, compare scripture with scripture or spiritual things with spiritual things, you really get a, a better understanding, and you, you move on, you progress, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to move on, we're trying to progress, and each year, we're, you know, we don't have to, uh, you know, wait till our birthday. I just had my birthday. You don't have to wait for your birthday to become another year older in spiritual maturity, do you? No, you can, you can fast track it, and the fast track in it is using that Romans 16 approach, understanding Paul's my gospel. Second, getting Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and then third, the scriptures of the prophets. If you understand that, I mean, you're, you're golden. You're good to go. So start in that order and, and move forward, and everything will really uh, start to fall into, into place. And uh, you'll have a, a power with the Scripture that a lot of people don't have. You know, a lot of people will try to make it up, and I'm t that's what I, unfortunately, I just get that, I get that so much, and it's so sad because, um, you know, I have, I have friends who are, are looking for healing. I have friends who are, have, you know, I have a friend of mine whose mom has, had a, had a, a brain aneurysm and stuff, and, and I think they're kind of angry at God because they're not really, getting healed, but I'm, I'm like, well, if, you, if you're just looking at that carnal aspect of it, yeah, you're still having problems, but if you would look at that spiritual aspect of it, just smile, because it doesn't, it's not, you, there's never a bad day. I mean, you're in, <laughs> you know? I mean, can we think about that? You know, the, the issue of Jesus Christ and, and uh, uh, coming to the earth is one that a lot of people have trouble with, but he's simply asking for you to believe. I mean, that's it? Yep, that's it. But that just sounds so stupid. Oh. Good, okay. You're now, you're, now you're agreeing with the scriptures. <laughs> See? They're quoting Bible on you. When they tell you that it's stupid, you're, they're, okay, well, let me show you. You're actually quoting a Bible verse, really? Yeah, 1 Corinthians, let me show you. So you're kind of going through this process. The Bible will read you. If you really do study the Bible and read it, it will read you. It will get down to your deepest core of you. And we're going to see that today with Peter and Simon. Oh, man. Wow, wow. I mean, I, I, I kind of, I had a, I, I, I was first relating Simon kind of to Ananias and Sapphira, but then I was like, you know, I don't, I don't think, I, I think it's a little different. I think this guy has, uh, he's putting on a charade. He's putting on a little act here, and I think we're going to be able to demonstrate that today. So we're going to go ahead and we'll open a word of prayer. We'll read through Acts chapter number 8, verses you know, 9 through 25, just to get to, I, I like to read through the whole thing. So you're getting the whole story, you're thinking about all the pieces that are in there, and then we'll pick back up. So let's open in prayer. Dear God, again, we thank you for the, the time to study. Thank you for your son, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for uh, the, the gift of eternal life, Lord. Thank you that it is a, a gift, Lord. We thank you that it is available, and it's unto all men. Uh, and it's upon all them that believe, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you that it's by your grace. We thank you that's not by works. And we thank you that it's through shed blood of Christ and the finished work on the cross. And as we study today and go over uh, the issue of Simon and him being a religious leader and him being uh, a man who, you know, is very likened to uh, the, the, the Pharisees or even modern day religion in the trickery and sorcery and uh, bewitchery that he does, Lord, help us to make those, uh, uh, you know, connections between the two and that we'll be able to uh, be mature in Christ and understand uh, how, how you see the scriptures and how you obviously have a plan. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So Acts chapter number 8, we'll start in verse number 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, 
giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because out of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Let's look at verse 18 just again. Verse 18, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. You know, we see Simon firsthand witness the authority of who? Of the apostles. Did they not have authority? They did. We studied that the last weeks. They have authority to lay hands and give the gift of the Holy Ghost. I mean, obviously, we talked that something transpired when this happened, right? We said that, you know, you can't really see the Holy Ghost today, right? You're not like going, oh, we saw this, and we saw this, and we saw that. There's no physical manifestation of that. Those verses in 1 Corinthians where he says the Jews require a sign, and then he says in the Greek seeks after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, right? So he's saying, so this, there, that's kind of eliminating the issue of the signs, eliminating the issue. But here it's very clear that there is a sign which transpires because what, what happens? Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands, the gift of the Holy Ghost was given. There was some sort of visible and observable event upon the gifting of the Holy Ghost, right? I mean, you've got to remember that, that Simon, he's, he's a sorcerer, as we read down in verse number 9, right? He, he used sorcery. Sorcery is magic. It's, it's trickery, right? It's really not what it appears to be. So make that really clear in your head. It's not what it looks like. Yeah, it looks like he's doing miracles. It looks like he's doing wonders. It looks like he's doing signs. But in fact, it's, it's what? It's trickery. It's lies. It's really not the real deal. So what we're going to see is that the people of Samaria, they have, they have regard for him because of this, and they think that he is what? Look what it says here. That he's the great power of God. Look at it says in verse 10 again. To whom? How many gave heed? They all gave heed. Really? All of them? Yeah, everybody. All of them. From what? From the least to the greatest. So it wasn't like he's out there and he's tricking the people who aren't very smart. And they're like, oh, wow, that Simon guy. No, he tricks the least to the greatest. Everybody is very captivated by Simon's performances. And that's really all they are. Their, their performances. And he's the one who's really giving himself out. It says there in verse number 9, he gives himself out that himself was some great one. You know what he really was? He's a religious leader. He's a leader of a religion. Is he not? You know, the, the main purpose of religion, how I see it, 
is dominion. People want to have dominion over you. That's what it is. They want to rule over you. They want to reign over you. And how do, how do kings rule and reign? What do they do? How, what makes them have authority? Well, they have laws, right? That's what they do. So they're going to get you in there, and they're going to give you a bunch of things to do. And at the end of the day, they're going to instill in you a fear of them, kind of like a reverence. But it's really not reverence. They're simply looking to have dominion over you. And they're doing it with sorcery, and they're doing it with trickery, and they're not doing it with the truth. The Samaritan people, I mean, they held him in admiration. They held him in respect because of his sorcery. And he's been doing this, as it says, for a long time. Look at verse 11. And to him, they had regard. So, I mean, kind of get in your mind who this guy is. This isn't just like a guy who's been out there for a week or, or a month, and people have been thinking about, oh, Simon, he's a cool guy. He's really been doing a lot of work. We think he's, he's definitely the great power of God. No, I mean, this is something that's been going on for a considerable amount of time. It says to him, they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched. So obviously, when you start to think about this, what happens? Start to put this in, into your mind, the picture of what happens. Philip comes on down, you know. I mean, he's scattered out. He's got to go through Samaria to get wherever he's going. He headed north after he left Jerusalem. He gets out. He's an evangelist. He likes talking about the word. He obviously has the Holy Ghost. He's chosen there in Acts chapter number, uh, I believe it's seven, I'm sorry, six, and he's the one that has, he's full of the Holy Ghost. He's got this ability to do power, signs, miracles, wonders. Obviously, he's going to do them. And he goes out there, and all of a sudden, there's this kind of a, a, a battle going on now. Uh-oh. We got Simon versus who? Philip. And we're going to show today that, that the true power, the true miracles, Simon was jealous of them. I mean, he had a jealousy. He was deeply jealous of what this man was able to do. I mean, for, for a good reason. I mean, he's, he's running the show down here. He's, he's up in Samaria, and he's, he's the ruler. I mean, he's got this thing going. He's bewitched him from the least to the greatest. And not only is he jealous of him, but he's envious. He had the power. Now he doesn't have the power. Now there's someone to compete with him for the people's respect. Now there's someone to, to compete for the reverence. Now he's like, man, I don't have that dominion anymore. Man, what am I going to do? What are you going to do? You start to think about, what am I going to do? Well, I've got, I got to do what he's going to do. I've got to get me some of that. That's right. That's exactly what it is. And I think by Simon's own admission, you can see in the following verses that this offer to, to, to uh, you know, here, let me, let me give you some money, demonstrates that he's impressed. He's like, man, I'm a kind of outmatched. I need to, I need to get what he has. That is, that he couldn't do what Philip was doing. Let's make that clear. That's what the offer to give money tells you. He can't do what Philip's doing. That's why i got to pay him to get it. I need to get that. I, I want it. I need it bad. I mean, if he was doing the same things Philip was doing, then the people would not have left him. The people would not have gone over to Philip, or gone over to Philip and, and, and left Simon, right? You kind of see how you keep reading. You start to see, man, there's a lot more to this than, than really meets the eye. You know, I liken this back to the magicians during Pharaoh and Moses' encounter. Go back to Exodus chapter number 8 for, for a second and look at this. Hold your place next. You know, hey, we'll be back in just a second. But in Exodus chapter number 8, I think a lot of us are familiar with this story. You know, God tells both Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh and tell them what? Let my people go, right? Goes and tells me, we're going to draw the nation of Israel out. We've promised this. It's going to happen. Let them go. So Pharaoh's been concerned, obviously, about the nation of, of Israel growing inside of their land for a while, in so much that he had been killing, right? He kills. He makes a decree in the beginning of Exodus to kill the midwives, to kill the, 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 the babies, because he's concerned that if we have too many men, oh, dude, they're outnumbering us at this point in time. Well, yeah, that's part of, that's part of the promise that, they, that they're given. So in Exodus chapter number 8, they've already gone through a couple little battles in which Pharaoh's magicians, Pharaoh's sorcerers, they're able to perform some tasks that, that look very similar to what Moses and Aaron is, are doing. So God just kind of ups the ante. He's like, okay, let's, let's go for this one. Look at verse 16. And the Lord said to Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. 
For Anne stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Anybody had lice before? It's horrible. It's horrible. I had it when I was like eight. And, you know, I think you only get it like once, hopefully. And then my dad just buzzed my head. And then, you know, you go get, you know, the, the cheap, easy way is to go down and get the, the dog wash, basically. And you just wash your hair with the dog wash. It's three bucks down at the pet store. Oh, don't go get that $25 one that's in the drugstore. Just go to the, go to the pet store and buy the same thing. He said, just close your eyes. I think I wore goggles. I think I remember it. We wore goggles. And we, he washed my head and got the lights out. But it was horrible. I mean, I remember it was itching so bad. And you're just like, it's just gross. And just think about that, that kind of thing. All the dust. And if you ever kind of picture Egypt, there's a lot of dust out there. There's a lot of sand out there. And the magicians did so with their enchantments. They're, they're like, oh, man, this one's going to be hard. They did so with their enchantments to bring forth lights. But they could not. They couldn't do it. And kind of think about this with Philip and Simon. He couldn't, he couldn't match them. He couldn't do them. So look at this admission that they make. So they were lice upon man and beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, look what they say to their leader. They say, look, this is the finger of God. Imagine that. Hey, I thought you guys were supposed to be my magician. You're supposed to be able to do anything these guys can do. No, no, this is the finger of God. They recognize that this is the real deal. This isn't just some makeup stuff. We're doing, you know, magic and sorceries. I got a little thing of, you know, dye in my pocket. I throw it in the water and, oh, there it is, you know. You know, that's the kind of stuff that they were able to do. But when they see this, they're like, this is, this is the finger of God. And that's just like what? That's just like, that's just like Simon. I mean, he sees it and he goes, this is... This is far greater than what I have, and I need it. i got to have this thing. If we back up a moment and we see in Acts chapter number 8, verse number 13, this was a question that I asked myself. I said, okay, Acts chapter number 8, verse 13, you know, is, is, Simon, a, is Simon a believer? And you ask yourself that question. Well, let's look at the text here. Verse uh, 13, then Simon himself believed also. Okay, well, Simon believes. And what does it say next? And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. But look what the, the end part is. And wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. I mean, can people say that they believe all the time? People say they believe. Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. But are they really a believer? Where does that issue really lie? It's in the heart, is it not? I mean, you can't see whether or not somebody's a believer or not. You can't. You can't tell. There's no, like, little mark. You're like, hey, show me your mark. You got your believer mark? Yeah, I got your believer mark. Okay, we're good. You know? There's nothing to delineate a believer from an unbeliever. There's nothing to do that. We don't, we don't really know. Right? Religion tries to make one. That's absolutely, definitely sure. Are you following all the rules? Are you doing everything just right? Okay, then you're a believer. That's how we know, right? So that's really not how it works. And I think if you look at Acts chapter number 8, you'll see Philip stating that, oh, I, I believe also. But from the preceding text, I think we can make it clear that, no, he's, he's not a believer. What is required for a man to possess eternal life? You know, what is it required for a man to possess eternal life at this point in time? Well, I think it's very clear in, in John chapter number 6, verse 47. Let's just look at that for a minute. Let's look at a couple of these verses. John 6, verse 47. And this is a cool verse because remember last week we talked about that word verily, right? When you see that word verily, it's kind of like truthfully. I'm getting ready to tell you something, and, and I know it may be hard to believe, but just go ahead and I'm going to put this verily in there, meaning I'm speaking of in verity. It's, it's truthful. I'm being sincere in what I say. This isn't just something I'm making up. And you see Jesus Christ use it twice here in reference to a pretty kind of unbelievable statement, especially in relation to religion today. I mean, many wouldn't, many wouldn't even remotely come close to believing this. But this is what the text states here. He says, and this is obviously in relation to the gospel of the kingdom. There's no belief in the, in, the, in the shed blood of Christ at this point in time, so make that clear. But John 6, verse 47, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I mean, that's pretty clear. Does it say, he that believeth and goes and gets baptized? No. Does it say, he that believeth and what? Picks up his cross and follows me, then he can have eternal life? No. Does it say, he that believeth on me and sells all his possessions, then he has eternal life? No. Do you believe that verse? Sure. 
where it lies, absolutely. That's a, that's a very great verse to understand what the issue of, of belief is and how necessary it is, and that's what God's really looking for. He's always looking for what? An issue of faith, constantly. And without faith, what? It's impossible to please him. So faith is the biggest issue that God's looking for from the very beginning. I think if you were to do a, uh, a study of this passage here in Acts chapter number 8, I think you can conclude that Simon, he's a bitter man. And that word bitter is used here in just a second. He was bitter about losing his reign of terror over the Samaritan people, about no longer being able to really you know, do the things that he, that he once was able to do, being that powerful religious leader. The people, in reality, were freed from religion by the gospel of the kingdom. I mean, they were freed from it. Great, this is awesome. So I believe the text states you know, that he believed, but I think he's just playing along. He did what everyone else was doing. And he continued with Philip beholding those miracles. Yet in his heart, that is in the deepest part of him, really he's, he's, uh, he, he's a liar. That is, that if he ever wanted to regain his position of authority, if he ever wanted to regain his position of leadership, what would he have to do? He'd have to get the power. So let's get into this topic, this, this offer of the purchase of the Holy Ghost. So go, look at verse 18. And when Simon saw it through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. You know, what we can see is that it appears that the apostles, what? They did not lay their hands on Simon, right? He's kind of sitting afar back. Well, why wasn't he right in front center? Hey, lay your hands on me right away. Get, get, get it on me. I want it right now. He's kind of sitting far back. Maybe he's just trying to play it cool, kind of see what's going on. He's like, ah, I really don't believe this anyways. I'm just trying to see how this works out. And, you know, he's a sly fox, and he wants to see how it goes down. He's, he's in a position looking onward at the apostles. And in Acts chapter number 8, verse 20, we see Peter's response to this. Verse 20 says, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee. We're going to look at that word perish in a second. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. I believe this is Peter exercising his authority to speak very boldly about the eternal state of a man. He has the ability to remit and retain sins. And here he says, thy money perish with thee. Oh, well, perish doesn't mean die. Well, no, quite frankly, it does mean die. Every really time it uses it, if you look at, uh, I give you one example, no, number 17, 12, it says, behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Okay, it's a great example. How about, how about uh, John chapter number 10, verse 28? That's a, that's a great one that compares uh, believing to what? Look at John chapter number 10, verse 28. That's a great one that compares believing and having eternal life to what? Perishing. He says, and I give unto them eternal life. Well, how do they get eternal life? We just saw that from John 6, verse 47. They were believing. Half eternal life. Okay, they get it. God gives it to them as a gift. And he says, and they shall never what? They shall never perish. So clearly from the text, we see that Simon believed, but now he's going to be perishing? I thought it says they'll never perish. Well, he's not believing. I think it's clear. Peter's going to talk about in a second that he's in this gall of bitterness, that he's in the bond of iniquity. That doesn't sound like somebody who has eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 15 as, as well. That's another really good one that talks about that same, same passage. It has the same correlation between having eternal life, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There you go. Very clear. That's what the issue is. He's looking for belief. And this gift of God, I mean, it's eternal life, and it's also the Holy Spirit. Peter has been instructed. What, he, what was he told way back in Matthew chapter number 10? Remember he says, freely ye have received, right? Freely give. And we saw a great example of this in Acts 3 with that lame man. When that lame man comes up to him and says, hey, you got any silver or gold? He's like, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto thee. And the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk, demonstrating authority, demonstrating his position of power. And he does that, and he gives him the ability to walk. And it's funny because the faith made the man whole. It's a good example. We can go through that later. You can go back and listen to the Acts 3 sermon. Well, I think he's not talking just about, you know, death, because, because really 
he's talking about the heart issue. He's not just saying, oh, well, he's going to die like Ananias and Sapphira. I think Ananias and Sapphira were believers. I think I've, I've gone through that, and we proved that out. But I think this man here, he's, he's an unbeliever. He's absolutely an unbeliever. And the reason is because of the heart. The issue that gets talked about next is the heart issue. I mean, can any of you here today look at my heart and tell me what's in my heart? Would you even be so presumptuous to try to do that? Oh, your heart is... Uh... You couldn't really tell. There's no way to really know. And why is that heart issue so important? Well, we're, what is the deepest part of a man? It's, it's the heart. And before anything really happens in your, in your mind, you kind of concoct it in your heart, you know? Before anything comes out of your mouth, you've already kind of had it in your heart going. It's not just your mind. Make that very clear. Your heart is a, is a different issue than your mind. Matthew 15, verse 18, he says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. You know, this passage is really good, and I kind of want to spend a minute talking about it, because it's a great example of religion. And it's a great example of religious leaders doing things that a lot of religions still do today, but in reality, their heart is not right. And if your heart's not right before God, well, he's the only one that can tell you that. Matthew chapter 15, verse number 1, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do the disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They wash not their hands when they eat bread. So obviously they're getting upset, the Pharisees are. They're saying, you guys need to wash your hands, clean your hands up before you eat. Well, there's no, there's no law in the law of Moses about washing your hands. This was a tradition that the elders had. So Jesus makes a statement, be answered to the Son of them, why do ye also transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? And that's what religion's really all about. It's about traditions more than anything. They're not really interested in the truth. Hey, our fathers did this, and our forefathers did this, and our fathers did this before. before blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, well, what does the Bible say? Oh, we don't really care about that. We just care about what we used to do all the time, and that's what we always do now. So we're going to continue it in this, in this lie. And it's, it's pretty interesting because, you know, you have a response to facing the truth. When somebody gives you the truth, what can you do? You can say, that's stupid. Goodbye. I want nothing to do with you. That's stupid. Or you can say, all right, let me think about that for a second. And you might humbly take a minute and say, I might be wrong. You know, that's how you grow. If, you can, if you're never able to be wrong, you'll never be very, you'll never grow very much. You won't. It'll never happen. I mean, I can be wrong. I've been wrong a lot of times. And to my pride, is that hurt? Yeah. But I don't care about my pride. That's what the flesh wants you to do. Oh, oh, man, I get all, all riled up. No, don't worry about that. That's okay. Because when you humbly accept the word of God as it is, and you go, okay, I'm going to take it in context. I'm going to grow with it. You will grow. But these guys here, they weren't really looking at the word of God. They're putting man's words above the word of God. That's what they do here. He's like, you're transgressing, Jesus says. You're transgressing it. How? By your tradition. Go over to verse uh, 7. He says, ye hypocrites. I'm sure most people say, I hate Christianity because they're all filled with hypocrites. I've heard it all the time. You guys are a bunch of hypocrites, bunch of hypocrites, bunch of hypocrites. And the joke is, yeah, we have room for one more. Come on over. He says, well did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Oh, yeah, Simon, I believe it. That's all good. Yeah, yeah well, I, I believe that stuff. Sure, sure. He's walking around. He's doing the, the stuff like everybody else is doing. But deep down inside of his heart, he is a bitter, bitter man. He's so envious and jealous of what Philip's doing. He wants that power so bad. He'd do anything for it. And you know, what happens? What's the old adage is? If you have enough money, you can do anything. You can buy anything. So what's he think? Well, I'll just go buy it. I'll go buy this gift. That's, that, that sounds good. Nobody's going to turn down money. Peter goes, yeah, I will. And I'll tell you the thoughts and intents of your heart right now. Verse 9, it says, but in vain they do worship me. 
they're thinking that they worship. This is what religion does. They think that they worship Jesus Christ. They think that they worship God. But they do it vainly. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into a mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. And why? Because that's what comes from the heart. Verse number 12, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? I think at this point in time, they're still concerned about being a little bit of a man pleaser. They're like, hey, those, those Pharisees were mad Jesus at you. Do you know that? He's like, I'm not a respecter of persons. I could care less. He says, every which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. And it's interesting because here's Peter, not understanding what's going on, saying, I don't get it. That's basically his next question. He says it. I don't, I don't understand. Declare unto this this parable. He's like, it's not really a parable. He says, uh, are you yet without understanding? Don't you get what's going on here? Do you not understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Can you do all that in your heart? You can fornicate in your heart? You can, you can uh, commit a theft in your heart? It's very contrary to how our society looks at wrong. Or morality, because they don't look at the heart issue. They look for you to physically do the act. We talked about this. We've been going over last week. We talked about crimes versus sin. If you haven't listened to that on YouTube, go ahead and sin versus crimes and crimes versus sin, or all crimes sin or all sins crime. Have a listen. It's pretty good. It's pretty interesting stuff. But really, it goes back to that Simon, you know, he's, he's a blind leader of the blind. He's blind himself, and he's still blind. You know, when Peter gets in here in, in Acts chapter number 8, and he says here uh, in verse uh, uh, 22, he say, or sorry, 21, he says, Thou wast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. He's now speaking that, hey, I see how God sees your heart. Well, yeah, that's what he's saying. He's not discussing, again, that, that organ that beats inside of a man. He's discussing not just the mind, but it's the core. I, I, I would say it's the, it's the deepest point of human cognition. It's really where everything comes from. It's that central issue. It's what God looks at. It's what God judges, not what men sees, but the ability to speak in this matter points again to Peter's authority to speak on the behalf of God and speak on the behalf of Christ. I remember he says the same things to Ananias and Sapphira. He says, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie? Where do lies come from? They come from the devil. And then you do what? You with your free will give in and believe it. God is the one who looks at the heart. Genesis 6, 5 says, God saw the wickedness of the man... And it says, and the imaginations of their heart, and it was only evil continually. That's what God looks at. I love that verse in 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You know what? Everybody has to understand. I want you to, if you, don't, if you get nothing else from today's you know, uh, lesson, understand one thing. That the almighty righteous God, in the form of Jesus Christ, he judges in a completely different way. While you may be able to skate through life and be like, look, I've never been arrested. I've never been caught committing a crime. You know you've probably committed plenty of crimes. You just never got caught. That's not going to fly with God. It won't work. Look at Romans chapter number 2, verse 16. It, won't, it doesn't matter. I don't care how hard you try to hide it. You can hide from men all the time, can't you? When you're a little kid and you do something wrong, man, I could cover it up so good. My parents would never know. I remember growing up, I was in high school. Oh, I went out drinking or something. I had to hide it up. And I could hide it good. My parents never could find out. Oh, they, they found out eventually. It took some time because all my friends would blab about something. And I'd be like, uh, I know we weren't there at John's house. I mean, I thought you said you were at Adam's house. Yeah, we were at Adam's house. John comes over. No, we were at, we were at Scott's house. Oh, man, we're in trouble. Where were you? Let me call his parents and find out where you were. Well, he said that you were at Jason's house. Oh, no. 
eventually you're in big trouble. If, hey, your sin will find you out. And if it doesn't find you out in this particular lifetime, just make sure it's very clear that this day right here, Romans chapter number 2, verse 16, he says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, that's the secrets of men's hearts. Think about it like this, you know. In a typical hearing or a trial, who do you got in a hearing in a trial? You got the judge, you got police officers, you got lawyers, advocates, you have bailiffs to keep the peace, you got witnesses out there. Jesus Christ, like, I don't need any of that. The only advocate that's allowed who has authority, who's admitted to practice in my court, is Jesus Christ himself. Oh, me! Yeah, I gotta be there. If you're not, I'm not your advocate, I'm sorry, it doesn't work. Think about it a little bit more like this. He doesn't even need any witnesses. There's no need for witnesses. What do witness, witnesses do? They testify, don't they? Witnesses get up, they testify in court, they tell you what's going on. Jesus says, I don't need any witnesses. Look at John chapter 2. He doesn't need any witnesses. There's no need. John 2 verse 25 Look at verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. Verse 25. And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. It's like, I know what your heart is. I know that because God and I have open communication. 24-7, 365. I see it how God sees it, how he reveals it to me. How just would a trial really be if the judge could look in, get through all the nonsense that happens in a trial, get through all the lawyer's trickeries, all their deceit, all their little lies and propositions, and just get right to the heart with the defendant, look right at him and go, I see your heart. And I'm going to reverse it, and I see it on that date and time, and you killed him. Wow. Would it be just? Absolutely. That would be pure justice right there. Is there any excuse? No. Because God's going to look right at that heart. You know, the question is what? Are you ready for that day? You know, when I worked at the state attorney's office, I did it for six months, and I, I, I did a fair, fair amount of trials and, you know, had some hearings and motions, and I was, I was always perplexed at the amount of people who would flat out just lie. You know? You get a witness, and you get their statement, and you got the, they made a written statement. You got a police report, and you're looking it over, and you're like, okay, this is pretty good, and yeah, you did this, and okay, so this is what happened. Yeah, yeah, okay, very good. Then you get them up on the stand, and you start to go over the questioning, and all of a sudden they're telling you something completely different than what the police report says, completely different than what their written narrative says, and you're like, oh, my goodness, uh, you're totally lying because you can't keep it together. You've, you've said eight different stories. You know, you're like, oh, no, and then the day comes. It's so much easier to tell the truth because the truth is what actually happened. And so you get there and you realize that you guys are all a bunch of liars. Like, God be true and every man a liar. I mean, if you can't tell me you've never lied, I mean, I don't understand how people can't say, that. oh, I've never told a lie. Really? Come on. You, you've definitely, oh, there's one right there, Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. And so if you would realize that the more you study the Bible, you do see the issue of sin become more pronounced. But the advocate, Jesus Christ, he's there. He's there to take care of all the sin 100% of the time, no questions asked. Go down again to uh, Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> Peter makes a perception. He says here in... Uh, Verse 22, he says again, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart, again, talking about the heart, this is the second time, may be forgiven thee. And Peter, in verse number 23, makes a perception. And I was trying to determine how, how I would define perception. I don't go, I, I try very hard not to go on the internet and just type in into Google, define, colon, space, perception. I don't do that. I try to sit there and make up my own definition for words. Because, you know, you, I use scripture, I try to use the facts that are happening, and I've said, I, I said, perception is a determination about facts using knowledge that bring about discernment to judgment. And I'll say that again. Perception is a determination about facts using knowledge that bring about discernment to judgment. I'm like, wow. That's what he's doing right here. He's like, I perceive that your heart is not right in the sight of God. He says, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness. And why is he bitter? 
because he lost his position. He lost his ability to rule and reign. He lost his reign of terror over these people. Remember, Peter can speak for God because he's, at this point in time, still until the Apostle Paul is raised up, he is God's chosen apostle with the other 12. He has the authority in John chapter number 20, verse 23, to remit and retain sins. Remember, this was the job of the high priest, which office was abolished in Christ. And remember in Mark chapter 2, verse 7, they started talking about the issue of forgiving sins. They said, who can forgive sins but God only? But the power of the apostles had was to offer men remission of their sins. If you look down at chapter 21 again, he says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. I mean, what really is the matter? I, I think the matter is the gift of God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's anything to do with spiritual matters. He says you have nothing to do with the gospel of the kingdom. And that's because you're in unrighteousness. unrighteousness and he's in the gall of bitterness. He lost his religion but he kept holding on to it. He lost his religious following, but he still wanted to be a religious man. And all because the apostles and Philip, that's why he lost it. He wanted to be equal with them. And Peter, he's calling it as he sees it. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he perceives that Simon is in that gall. I run into a lot of people on a regular basis who are quite religious, very religious actually. In fact, they're incredibly religious people. I do all kinds of very good things. I go down to the soup kitchen to help out. I do all these things. I'm like, oh, that's great. I'm glad you do all those things. Why do you do them? And is your heart right in the sight of God? But they don't understand that. That doesn't make any sense to them. Because when you start preaching the cross to them, they're like, well, that's so stupid. That just sounds so easy. That's just how easy it is. That's just how easy it is. Because there's no other way it could be. Because you'd screw it up any other way. The free will choice of man is to choose. When people say, oh, I can't believe God would send so many people to hell. That's a wrong statement. Why? Because so many people choose to go to hell. They choose to do it because they reject the free gift of eternal life. The lost people are really blinded. And like Simon was blinded here, he's blinded by the power of sin, the power of you know, iniquity, that gall of bitterness. And that verse in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, I know you guys know that passage. It's a great one. It really tells you what, what it's all about. 4 verse 2, I love when he says, but we'll have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. This is, what, this is what Simon could have done. Oh, guys, you know what? I was just completely, I was pulling your chain the whole time. This was just a complete lie. It was a sham and to which I'm very sorry for doing this. But now I've been presented with the truth, the truth of the gospel, and I think I'm going to believe this. He says, and hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. Isn't that what so many do? They're very crafty with the words. Not, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Look, you don't think that every church around the area is going to open up a book, and maybe a modern translation of the Bible, but they're going to open up a book, and they're at least going to read you one verse, probably. Probably at least going to get one out of them you got a 95% chance it'll be something between Matthew 5 and 7, but that's from my own statistics of going to many different churches. It's not scientifically proven or anything, but he says, but the manifestation of the truth, that's what you want to do, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You know, people treat you like an enemy when you do that. That's what Paul says. He's, he got into with the Galatians. He's like, man, why are, you, why are you getting so mad at me when I quote a Bible verse? Why are you getting so mad at me when we try to help you out? You know, your response to the truth when you're faced with the truth is either continu continue in denial and in unbelief or humbly accept. And the humbly part is probably the most difficult because I think America is very, very prideful. We are. I mean, man, in general is prideful, but America is very prideful. I mean, you don't, don't tell anybody. I mean, come on. It's all about relativism. Don't tell somebody that they're wrong. Let the little kid, oh, he's horrible on his test. Just give him a, give him a C plus. Just, yeah, he's fine. He's doing good. Well, no, if we don't tell him he's wrong, he's never going to succeed and do better. You know, and that's kind of the same thing with the Bible. We want to help people succeed and, and to do well and to grow in grace and understanding that is in Christ. 
When you tell somebody the truth and use the word of God, you, you get to the core. And the word of God does that because it pierces people's hearts. And they either flat out resist you and let Satan do his work, or they become helplessly kind of responsive, don't they? You ever get somebody where you really share the gospel with them and you've really gone down the path and they really don't know anything and you've really gone over it with them and you can tell that that, that person is being convicted of sin, of judgment to come, and they're like, all right, what's the next step? Well, the next step is kind of like how Peter says in Acts chapter number 2, verse 37, you know, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They're like, I got conviction. Conviction's good. You can lose conviction over time. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. Then you just got to preach it harder. And the more you hear it, what are you kind of doing? Ah, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. Blow it off, blow it off, blow it off. Give more lead way to the devil. Then it becomes more difficult for you to become a believer. It really does. The more you reject the truth, the more difficult it is for you to become a believer. If you believe it in the beginning, much better off. But see, Satan, he's got that, he's got that power. He wants, to, he wants to do it. You know, imagine it like a battle between two knights. And the one knight knocks the other's shield out of his hand. Then he knocks the sword. Then he makes his, knocks his helmet off. The one is standing there. His neck's exposed. The other holds the sword. And you get him at their greatest point of weakness. And Peter, I mean, he really does that with Simon. He gets right to that heart of the issue. He says, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. And he says, you know, repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. I mean, man. That's some serious stuff right there. Simon, I think we can say he's legitimately scared of Peter. He's scared of this outcome. Why do we say that? Well, look at his response, you know. He just told him that he's going to perish. Peter says, you're going to perish. Your money perish with thee. Pray God. And he just saw this God perform some miracles, perform some wonders, perform some signs that he had no power to do. He's like, well, man, this guy must be the real power of God, not me. So what? Look what he says in verse number 24. Then answered Simon and said, pray ye to the Lord for me. What is that? That's a recognition of whatever you're saying. He's thinking, this is a curse you just put on me. And he's like, I don't want that. You pray to your Lord to get rid of that thing. I don't want any of this stuff. He says, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. You know, it's interesting, there's no really resolution to any of this. That's it. Done. That's all you get. He just says that. That none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Did he become a believer? Well, I don't think so. I think extra biblically, there's a lot of stuff, but you know, we can't say for sure. I think from what the text is. There's some cool things if you look in the Apocrypha, if you look in uh, Josephus and things like that, there's some cool stuff to go about. But, you know, either way, we know the truth about false religion. It's sorcery, it's trickery, it's deceit, and it's not from God. Let's look at uh, one more passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 23, and we'll be done. Matthew chapter 23 is probably my second favorite passage in all the Scripture. Maybe actually my first, I don't know, uh, in terms of... Uh, Religion. And this is what religion really does in verse number 15. They're looking for the numbers, and he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. I mean, that's what religion's going to really do for you. It's going to make you do a fold more. I mean, it's not good. And, and, and I know it's hard because a lot of people say, oh, man, I mean, doesn't religion do so much good? No, they really don't. That good that they're doing is self-righteous works. In the eyes of men, it's good. But as God looks at that heart, he says, you're trying to, you're trying to be like me without me. And that doesn't work. If you go look at verse number 25 of that same passage, I'm just going to read these last verses. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, and this is typical religion, for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within, within they are full of extortion and excess. Who looks at the inside? God does. Jesus Christ does. He's like, yeah, you guys look all clean. Your robes are all clean. Your suits are all nice and pressed. Ladies' dresses are all good. You guys curled your hair. You put your, you know, you put your stuff on. You walked in there. You guys all put on your smiley faces. I hate that lady. And you shook her hand anyways. And you're like, I hate you too. And I don't like you. And then we got over here and we gossiped for a little bit about all the other stuff that happened. 
That's what they do. They make clean the outside of the cup. They try to look like it's good. But see, at the day when Jesus Christ judged the secrets of men, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, you can't get past that part. That part says, oh, that's great. I'm glad that's all good. But I, I'm looking at the heart issue now. The intents of the heart. Now, blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So that's what, that's what should happen. The outside of them, what? Should be clean also. May be clean. See, when you believe the gospel, not necessarily always going to get the full understanding. You may not understand that now you should mortify the deeds of the body, go through Romans 6, 7, and just, sometimes it just isn't happy. You don't get the preaching. Somebody may give you the gospel, but that may be it. Look what he goes in verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like unto whited sepulchers. That's when they paint a, a, a tomb to make it look prettier than it is, but which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also, now look at this word, outwardly appear righteous unto men. Unto who? Unto men. You don't outwardly appear righteous unto God. No, absolutely not. But within, how God sees it, ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. <laughs> Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves, ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up, then, the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Well, the only way you're going to escape the damnation of hell is through Jesus Christ. That's it. You know, Jesus Christ is the answer. His death, his burial, his resurrection to clean you from the inside out. Next week, we're going to pick up with Philip the Evangelist and that Ethiopian eunuch. That's a, oh, just be prepared. That one's probably going to take three weeks, probably. There's a lot to go over with him. Uh, he's a cool guy. Uh, interesting stuff with Candace the Queen and stuff. So we'll, uh, we'll close in prayer.